chapter four, message in the dark. Well, hello again and welcome back to Riverwood Cabin. I'm Rosie Boom and I'm reading to you from where lions roar at night, the fun and adventures of a pioneering New Zealand family. Written by me, Rosie Boom. And we are up to chapter four. Message in the dark. With every passing day, the barn transformation continued. Mum arrived home from town one afternoon with a roll of lino and a set of stairs on the trailer. Only $90, a bargain, she boasted. Well, we'll wait and see if they fit, said Dad. Bother, said Mum, when they carried the stairs inside and propped them up from the loft. Just a bit short. Dad looked at them and then got out his tape measure. We're only 30 centimetres off. I've got an idea. Sam followed him out to the workshop and watched him get his chainsaw. What are you going to do, Dad? Watch and learn, Sam. All it needs is a bit of Kiwi ingenuity. They headed off to the meadow and soon returned with a large rectangular block of macrocarpa wood that Dad had cut out of one of the logs lying on the land. The family lifted the, st the staircase while Dad positioned the block of wood on the floor. It'll be rustic, but it'll do the trick. Perfect, cried Mum when they set it down. That night, when it was time for bed, the family climbed up a solid set of stairs. Dad had cut a branch from a tree, and then he and Sam stripped the bark and made it into a rustic handrail for the stairs. Mum sat on the top step and gazed down into the lounge. Good riddance to the ladder. I'm just glad none of us fell down it in the middle of the night. Angel and Lucy trotted up and down a few times, glad to be independent at last in their search of a bed. Neither dog had overly enjoyed being hoisted up and down the ladder. The next day, Millie ran from one room to another, watching all the exciting happenings. Dad and Josiah spent the morning laying pavers under the large lean-to at the front of the barn. It was a big area, and Mum couldn't wait to be able to eat out there on hot summer nights. When they were all laid, Dad nailed a brushwood fence at the east end of the porch to provide shelter from the prevailing winds. Millie helped Ellie set up two round picnic tables and chairs at each end of the porch. Then they dressed them up with tablecloths and set a small vase of carrot weed on each table. Inside, Kate and Mum had moved the boxes marched, marked kitchen into the kitchen area and were busy unpacking the boxes in the lounge. When they finally squashed the last empty box, Mum wiped her face. <gasps> what a job! But now for the fun stuff. They rolled out the black and white checked lino over half the room and then set up the two metre round table. Dad had made it out of two inch rimu and had used an old power pole as the support. It had deep fissures and lines that he said reminded him of an old lady's face. On the top, there was a large Lazy Susan. M Millie put Mum's favourite candle in the middle and then clapped her hands. It looks amazing! Then they chose a place for the first bit of furniture that Dad had ever made, a large Welsh dresser. The three girls spent a good hour unpacking all the crockery and pots and pans. Millie found a box of mum's preserves, plums and pears and peaches. She put some of them in a row on the top shelf of the dresser. Then she piled up mum's assortment of cane baskets on the very top. Meanwhile, Dad helped mum shift Joe's desk into a corner of the kitchen. It was actually a hundred-year-old piano 
that Mum had saved from somebody's scrap pile. She had brought it home and told Dad she was going to salvage the beautiful bits of timber in it. But then she'd had a brainwave. If Dad would just help her take out all the inner workings of the piano and redesign it just a bit, it would make a beautiful desk. She was right. It looked amazing. Mum had suggested to Dad that if they just did up a few more old pianos, they could sell them and make quite a bit of money. Dad had quietly but firmly told her there was no just about it. Her brainwave had actually taken a lot of work. They positioned the desk into the corner by the fridge and then stood back and looked at it. There was no doubt about it. The old piano would make a wonderful pantry. Next, Kate and Mum rolled out a large piece of old Axminster carpet on the other half of the room. Millie felt so excited. It seemed like the barn was becoming home all in a matter of a few hours. She helped Mum and Ellie set out the sofa and chairs and then bookcases and piano. Mum opened a box full of paintings, all wrapped individually in towels and blankets. After a search, she smiled and held up a framed cross-stitch Auntie Penny had given her for a birthday present. She found a hammer and nail and held up the frame above the piano. Is it in the centre? A bit to the left, said Kate. Mum hammered in the nail with a few short blows, hung the frame and then stood back to admire her work. Perfect, she said in a tired, satisfied voice. Then she collapsed on the sofa and closed her eyes. Play me some Chopin, would you, Kate? Soon the old barn was filled with the strains of Chopin's Nocturne in E-flat minor. Why are you crying, Mum? asked Jake, looking a bit anxious. Are you sad? Dad looked up and laughed. Watch and learn, Jake. She's not sad, she's happy. Women often cry when they're happy. Weird, whispered Jake. Mum looked at them and smiled. Wonderfully, gloriously happy. Can life get any better than this? Dad reached down and pulled Mum up by the hand. Play us a waltz, Kate. He led Mum outside and all the kids watched Mum and Dad have their first waltz on the new courtyard. The next day, Dad and Josiah cut two big holes in the tin walls at both ends of the barn. It made a terrible racket, but by evening, two large windows were in place. Look at the light in the room, said Mum. Chris, you're amazing. What about when we get rid of the roller door, said Millie. Then it'll be as good as a real house. Better, said Mum. This is much more fun than living in an ordinary house. Dad gazed around the room. Well, it'll make a pretty fine home for us while we build our house. And he grabbed Mum and spun her around the lounge in a crazy jig. The next day, the transformation continued. It was time to create the master bedroom. During one of the first explorations of the barn, someone had made a wonderful discovery. At the back of the main room was a smaller room, which used to be the cow shed. It was dark and smelly, with a sagging roof and large tin doors at one end. Years of mud and dirt covered the floor. But on this particular day, someone had kicked at the floor absently with their gumboot and discovered that underneath all the muck was a concrete floor. A wobbly, uneven one, but solid concrete nonetheless. Our master bedroom, Mum had exclaimed. Dad got to work. He chainsawed a doorway in the wooden wall between the front and back rooms while Mum and Auntie Penny got to work with the water blaster. Soon it looked a lot less dingy and quite habitable. 
Then Dad fired up his brand new concrete mixer and evened up the floor with a thin layer of concrete. He replaced the large steel doors at the east end of the room with a window. New supports lifted the sagging floor of the loft a couple of inches. Just as well I'm not an inch taller, said Dad as he walked through the room. Anyone over six foot two will have to watch their heads. Finally, it was time to decorate the room and make it beautiful. Mum clapped her hands with excitement at the thought. Millie watched her and grinned. Soon, Dad would be complaining about all the trinkets lining the logs in the wall. She and Mum helped Dad work out the best way to lay the offcuts and squares of Axminster carpet. The patterns of the different pieces didn't match, but they all had the same rich blues and reds and greens. The room began to glow with warmth and colour. Then they carried in all the different parts of their large Rimu bed. Dad had saved the old fence timber from being burned, claiming to the farmer that he would think of something to make out of it. And he did. He and Mum had worked together in the garage for two weeks, in the evenings making their king-size bed. It had slatted ends and four big posts at each corner. It was almost big enough to fit the whole family in on birthday mornings. Mum whistled happily as she held the different pieces steady while Dad bolted them together. You should stick to singing, my dear, said Dad after a while. Mum ignored him and tried to keep whistling, but her lips were quivering with laughter. She knew from experience what was coming next. Dad didn't disappoint her. He pursed his lips and casually began to whistle an extravagant showy trill. An hour later, the room was finished. It looked wonderful. Some of Mum's precious paintings and the children's artwork hung on the wall and a lamp glowed on the dressing table. Mum flopped down on the bed and gazed around the room. I feel as rich as a queen. Oh, you funny thing, laughed Dad. You're easy to please and cheap to keep. At Mum's excited call, all the other children and Angel piled into the room and leaped onto the bed. Millie looked at the wrought iron candlestick holder on the wall. Josiah had given it to Mum for Christmas last year. A fat, deep red candle flickered warmly inside it. A faint smell of vanilla wafted in the air. She smiled to herself. Dad had relented about the candle, seeing as this was yet another special occasion. Mum smiled at Dad with shiny eyes. Remind me again, Chris, why are we building a house? Later that afternoon, when no one was watching, Millie crept into Mum and Dad's bedroom and knelt on the bed. She squeezed some liquid out of a small tube and began to carefully paint on the rafter above the bed. She smiled to herself as she worked. She couldn't wait to hear Mum's cry of surprise when she went to bed that night. When Millie finally collapsed into bed later, her body ached with all the lifting and carrying she'd done that day. It was going to take a lot of willpower to stay awake. She could hear Mum and Dad sitting in the lounge, talking in hushed voices and then laughing together. If only they would go to bed. She needed to stay awake, but her eyes felt so heavy. At last, she decided she would shut them just for a moment, just to rest them. The next thing she knew, the morning sun was glinting through the crack in the curtain. She jumped out of bed and went downstairs. Mum was sitting at the breakfast table. She looked up at Millie with smiling eyes. Thank you, darling, she mouthed. She turned to the others. Last night, when Dad and I finally got to bed, I was so excited to be in our new room. 
I turned off the light and lay staring up at the rough wooden ceiling, thinking about all the wonderful things that had happened that day. Then suddenly something began to glow. Dad and I couldn't believe our eyes. A message began to appear on the wooden beam. Jake stared at her with wide eyes. What was it, Mummy? Mum glanced over at Millie. It said, I love you, Mum. Millie looked down at her plate. She felt all hot around her neck and her throat felt tight. Jake stared at her for a moment and then complained. How come she got the glow-in-the-dark paint, Mum? It was my Christmas present, dummy, Millie snapped. She didn't mean it to come out so growly. It just did. She often said things the wrong way when she was feeling all emotional, and then she always felt mad at herself. All the kids had wished they'd got the glow-in-the-dark paint for Christmas. Millie remembered Mum coming home from a camp a few months earlier and telling them how she'd got a big surprise when she'd turned off the light the first night. A message had begun to glow in the dark above her. Written across the ceiling were the words, Seize the day. Mum had been so taken with it. she had told them she wanted some glow-in-the-dark paint herself so she could write messages to unsuspecting children. Dad had begun offering suggestions like, have you cleaned your teeth? And tidy your room. But mum thought seize the day was much better. Millie glanced up at mum who was still smiling and she knew then that to mum, not even seize the day was better than I love you. We're going to have to do something about these birds, said Dad one evening. A sparrow's droppings had just narrowly missed his dinner. The other morning, a bird had been perched right above Mum's glass at the worst possible time. Millie looked up into the rafters. At least five little sparrows perched happily above the dinner table. But they're so cute! The next moment, something landed on Dad's roast potato. He pushed his plate away. That does it. I'll teach them. He strode from the room and returned carrying a pair of his woolen work socks. Josiah grinned at him with a mocking smile. Whoa, that's going to hurt. Dad took careful aim and threw the socks as hard as he could. Sparrows scattered in all directions. Angel and Lucy ran around the room barking excitedly. Everyone gazed up at the ceiling. The socks were stuck high above the table between the rafters and the tin roof. Darn, exclaimed Dad, that's my best pair. Now how am I going to get them down? Maybe they'll serve as a sort of scarecrow, suggested Mum, laughing. Right said Dad in a decisive voice. Tomorrow, I'm going to block up every hole in the walls and keep the wretched little things out. <laughs>